All right, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for, for coming. Um, I'm open to questions throughout. If we want to do it that way, please just raise your hand, let me know, or just shout it out. As long as it's a nice question, I'm happy to field it. All right, uh, so my vision for urban and community forestry. I actually started writing this slide deck and putting everything together, and I thought I should really actually think about how I would say this vision. So this is what I came up with. Right, I want to create or help and lead to create an urban and community forestry program that attracts a diverse group of students. Okay? Because urban forestry in and of itself is a diverse field. It's very interdisciplinary. It involves lots of different experts and research in, in many different areas. And I want to make sure that I'm doing that with a collaboration with both faculty and staff here at UNL and then agencies throughout and industry. I think uh, urban and community forestry has a lot of ties to different groups and I think getting involvement from all of those groups in terms of what's necessary, what's needed so that as students here at UNL actually attend finish and want to get a job so they can pay for the schooling they just had, right? That I want to make sure that they're marketable and those skills are marketable. So an approach for how I'm going to go through the talk today, right, I want to talk about some changes in perception in terms of urban and community forestry. I want to give some idea of what I think are the diverse opportunities that exist when you, uh, either in studying for this degree or when you're finished with, with a degree in urban forestry. And then I'll actually break down into the undergraduate program itself and how I feel the different components of the undergraduate program uh, will best serve the community here at UNL. So changes in perception, right? This is, I just came across this actually a couple of days ago. This is from uh, Milwaukee, they were talking. So that talks about really there's never enough tree people, enough, enough people in the tree care industry, which includes urban forestry and arboriculture. And this is something that I thought was interesting. And this is, I hear this a lot, right? I thought this industry was just about cutting down trees. I had no idea that you could do other stuff with it. Okay. So we really need to change that sort of idea that just because there's forestry in the title doesn't mean it's only about logging. Okay. Um, here, here we see there's been research on this in terms of the interdisciplinary nature. This actually just came out in June of this year and really talking about and looking at the programs that exist at other universities and where urban forestry sort of fits into either an environmental school, a forestry school, and one of the exciting things about this program and what really attracted me to it and why I wanted to apply for it is that it would be, as Scott said, it would actually be a major and not just a track within some other major. So I think that's really important. And then thinking about how we go about incorporating uh, urban planning, design, policy into that actual major, because those are all the different fields that an urban forester or somebody working in urban forestry will have to be fairly comfortable and fluent in. Uh, so the diversity of opportunities. So for folks that really just want to work with trees, right? There's lots of species diversity and how to diversify communities. There's pruning, there's planting. That's actually a picture of me. I do plant trees on occasion. I will get dirty if need be. Um, fungus and pathogens, pathology. Right? Some people are really, really interested in insects and pathogens that they see around, and so there's definitely room for that, and I think is actually a very important part to looking at urban forestry. Here in Nebraska, you're starting to deal with emerald ash borer. We've been dealing with it in Minnesota for a number of years now, and so really having people that are good and tuned into these things is very important. Soil sciences, engineering, um, how we actually build an urban environment, so thinking at I do a lot of work on construction damage and the construction impact to trees and trees impact to construction. Right? It's a two-way street. And so looking at how can we engineer solutions, whether it's silver cells or structured soils, or whether it's increasing boulevard medians, and then how do soil relationships play into that? What types of soils cause different shrink swell capacities or different nutrient availability, and how does that impact trees over the long term? Right? We don't want to plant a tree that lasts a few years. We want to plant a tree that lasts for a very long time. Stormwater and hydrology, this is really becoming an important aspect of urban forestry, especially as you look at how farmlands and runoff from agricultural fields might impact water quality. We certainly look at this with larger rain events and how this might impact um, the urban environment in general, making sure that we're keeping more of that water in an urban environment. And so there's opportunities here. One of the groups I work with in Minnesota is the Soil and Water Conservation District that really works on these stormwater quality issues. And so another 
very important part of the urban forestry. And then for people who really just like technology, let's face it, I'm from a technology background. I get kind of sucked in by some of this stuff on occasion as well. So for folks that just want to learn how to use GIS or are really interested in GIS, I have a student right now who was an arborist for a number of years and worked in urban forestry. And when he came back for his degree, he really wanted to focus on the GIS and the technology side of urban forestry. Right, so to utilize those skills, but also use the technology. And UAVs, I've been told by the, uh, the guys that run these, I'm not allowed to call them drones anymore. Um, <laughs> So I get yelled at quite a bit for that. But you can see that we're starting to incorporate UAVs right, into urban forestry and, and arboriculture. Okay. Community and regional planning. This is a big part, I think, of what urban forestry is, or a big intersection of where these um, different disciplines can sort of help each other out. Right? Cities are great. Um, for a lot of reasons. We have roadways, we have sidewalks, we have infrastructure, but we also want trees in those, but then it's not a natural area. And so we need to be cognizant of how trees might plan into that or play into those infrastructure. And this major should really get at that. And then for people who really like policy, really like contracts, contract management and planning, here's some Snickers. People do like these, I've been told. Um, but it's really an important aspect of looking at how do we deal with this. There's emerald ash borer coming out. There's been other problems like Dutch elm disease. Uh, ALB, Asian longhorn beetle, is definitely becoming a problem in the eastern part of the US. And thinking about how policies, uh, either nationwide or in our municipalities, can help deal with these pests and pathogens from a financial standpoint, from a legislative standpoint, a legal standpoint, is very important. Okay, So the actual undergraduate program, right? what, 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 what might this look like? So s some foundational elements. Education, right? obviously. Right? Um, there's outreach, which I think is a very important part of any, especially a land-grant university, the ability to outreach with the communities that you're serving. And here, um, with my discussion with the search committee earlier, really the idea is that Nebraska would serve as this sort of urban uh, forestry hub throughout the sort of Midwest and West. And so looking at how, what that might look like. And then research. I'm a researcher. I'm currently completing some research. And so I think that research, even in, at least in, in some limited capacity or smaller capacity, um, is really an important part all the way up to grand scale research that we might be able to collaborate with uh, folks in other communities or other states. Okay. And then student engagement. I think this is an important piece that we don't talk about enough, but I think it's really important to understand how to engage students and to keep students engaged within the actual program itself. Okay. So let's start with the education piece. So see there's some potential new course offerings that I would see as important here. I think that experiential learning is a big part of this, and there's some discussion about how this would f function with distance learning. And basically, being able to do hands-on and then reflect on that from a perspective of what did I actually learn from this hands-on experience is very important, uh, and tie that in with some traditional classroom and other online options. Okay? So the first class that I think we could add in is a class in dendrology. Right. This is tree, shrub, and I like to add in a wood ID component. I work a lot with wood species, uh, different tree species and the wood of those species. And I think when we look at things like um, movement of firewood and transmission of disease vectors and things like that, that this is actually fairly important. It would be primarily a field-based. And then a woody and, uh, tree and woody plant biology, I think is very important to understand how trees actually function. Uh, a class in arboriculture, which is what a lot of traditional urban forestry programs really focus on this one, but I see it as just a, a part of, of this interdisciplinary uh, field. And then sort of an emerging field, urban ecosystems, and really looking at how urban ecology plays into this field of of urban and community forestry, and then kind of a cap it all off an urban uh, forestry and urban green space management course, and sort of what those would look like. Okay. So to start off dendrology, I'll kind of explain my, my thinking of this. This class I currently teach at the campus of the University of Minnesota. Um, 
it's, it's actually happening right now. Somebody else is filling in for me today. But this is a class that we teach. It's, it's really one of the entry level courses to the major. And it's one that really attracts students, I think, to this major. We spend, uh, for the field portion of it, we spend about three hours on campus once a week, walking around, looking at trees, shrubs, and uh, woody vines occasionally. And actually, not only just identifying them, but talking about how they're, where they grow in a, in a native and natural environment, and then also how we might utilize these in a landscape in, in a way that benefits the, the humans that live in that landscape, that benefits the wildlife that lives in that landscape, and sort of the plus and minus of, of different tree species in different locations. Okay? I also, there is the ID component, so we look a lot at twigs, and the wood ID, I think, is actually fairly important. This is actually a picture I took of one of the tree cores that I work on as part of my research, so being able to look at that and identify the species, and being able to really appreciate that this little tiny hole right there is only, it's, um, it fits, there's about three of those that'll fit across to about uh, 0.3 millimeter space, and to realize that that's how trees move water is really sort of fascinating to me. And to think about what a damage to a tree might do in terms of, of impacting that. So in terms of evaluation of the student learning outcomes, I think that anytime you put together a course, you need to figure out first, what's the objective? What should the students take away from this class? And in order to evaluate that, I usually start off this class actually with a pre-course quiz, which looks really daunting to most students when they first look at it. I never grade it. It's just, I mean, it doesn't go in as part of the student grade. But it's to give me an idea of where students are so that I know some classes come in much more prepared than other courses. And I really want to see where students are at. And then I give that exact same quiz at the very end of the course for a couple of reasons. One, I want to see, did I actually meet all of the objectives? How successful was I? And it's also, I think, sort of fun for students to see, oh, I knew nothing about this class when I started, and now I could answer this quiz quite well. And then there's usually weekly field identification quizzes, where we learn trees one week, you get tested on them the next week. Okay. I think the best way to learn these types of things is to go out and have repeated sort of interactions and involvement with them. Uh, tree and woody plant biology. I haven't actually had the uh, fortune to teach this class yet. I've developed some um, integration of this into other courses that I've taught, but I think it's really an important look at how trees and woody plants function beyond just how plants in general function and really focusing on plant and soil interactions and plant atmosphere and soil continuum, sort of how that works. And I think that you can approach that really well with the tree and woody plant biology. So quizzes. And then what I like to do, I, I think one of the best ways to learn almost any topic is to teach that topic. And so really having, as part of the evaluation, students would take a particular topic and design a presentation or, or actually a lecture in order to give that. And I think that you then become very well versed in that particular uh, portion of the course. And it's a good way for students to sort of demonstrate exactly what it is that they're learning and taking away from it. Um, in a class in um, Arboriculture, basically, is a combination of field work and class work and some online. I've been experimenting with how to do some of these things online. And if you become an arborist, this is a lot of what you do. So here, um, Ashley is uh, basically taking, this is called an air knife or an air spade. It's basically a high pressure air system. And you use it to evaluate root systems and take a look at that. So we actually have one of these that we use on campus so that we can blow away the soil without damaging the roots. And then we can investigate the root growth pattern or what kind of root damage there is. And here, Alyssa and Aaron are actually drilling into this tree. This is an ash tree, by the way. It had succumbed already to emerald ash borer, so we're not injuring it too badly. Uh, it was removed a few days later. But basically, we were using this to look at the wood structure. Right? What is the components of it? So these are two different methods. Aaron is using a $5,000 resistograft, and Alyssa is using a $100 drill and a $2 drill bit to basically mm -hmm. accomplish the same thing. So understanding what tools are available and giving them some hands-on. I mean, you can teach this out of a book, but actually being able to do this and experiment with the different techniques to get a feel for how wood changes as the density changes. Online quizzes, and then usually what I have students do is create um, some sort of guide, right? Both for professionals and for homeowners, because that's as soon as people find out you learn about trees, they start asking you every possible tree <laughs> question they've ever encountered, and this is a great way to help you find some answers yourself, right? Yeah. You said to throw in a question. How would your class uh, in our core culture mm -hmm. 
differ or would it differ from the sorts of certification available from the professional society for yeah, so, so the big professional society is the International Society of Aboriculture, for those that are not familiar. Um, basically, this is a much more in-depth look. If you look at, I am actually an ISA certified arborist, and if you look at their certification guide, it definitely starts off at a little bit lower level. This is a university course, so it would be a much higher level. We'd go more in-depth to wood structure, wood function. We'd stay probably a little bit further away from the actual um, using of chainsaws and things like that. I think those are things you can learn while actually in the classes, and this would be more of the function of how do trees work, how would you go about doing some of the higher level things that arborists do do. Is that? Yeah, good, okay. Um, oh. Sorry, mm -hmm. would students be able to work on a certification note? Yeah, abs absolutely. Class? Yes, so the way the certification works uh, for ISA is you need to have, this is one of the paths, you need to basically have a four-year degree in an urban forestry program and at least one year minimum experience. And so my goal is that all the students that come through the courses I interact with is that by the time they graduate, they've got one to three at least seasons, if not years, but at least th seasons of experience, so that when they're done, they could actually sign up and take the ISA exam right off the bat. I usually recommend that everybody at least utilize the book that ISA puts out to get some of the nuanced things that they cover for their certification. But in terms of the tree biology, tree identification, all of that, this class would definitely address in much more uh, depth than ISA actually requires. Um, and then field evaluation. So sometimes we have to go out and we learn about tree defects, which is very important as an arborist to be able to identify those. And so we usually talk about them in class. I have students go out and find those. And then as part of the evaluation, we actually walk around and I point at a tree and say, list the defects, right? Um, list some, occasionally students will find defects I didn't notice when I first walked up to it, um, which is great, right? Sometimes I have to go back out and look at that. but. Um, I think it's a really good way to, to take this higher level education and give it a practical spin and actually show students that how this is utilized. Uh, ecosystem services or, or urban ecosystems and not only looking at the ecosystem services but also looking at urban ecology in general. So this is again, this is kind of, I, I put this one in here because I think it's an important direction that urban and community forestry is moving into and you're starting to see more and more research being done on the urban environment. Instead of just saying, we have living things and we have non-living things in the urban environment, it's really more looking at that as, it's sort of a human-made construct and a human-made ecosystem. How do we actually go about studying that? How do we actually think about those interactions? There's pollinators, there's insects, there's pests and pathogens. How do they move through an ecosystem? And I think that this would be a great class to collaborate with other folks in the department to really see how we could integrate all of the different disciplines into sort of teaching this this class. I would see online quizzes and I would love to see this be more of a research oriented course where we each student picks or the class as a whole picks a research project that is worked on and that's what's done in terms of sort of the final thing for the entire course. So you actually take some part of the urban ecosystem and study it and really figure out what's going on. And then to kind of cap all of this off Right? Would, this is the capstone class that um, I think is really sort of an interesting way to do this. This is one that um, I haven't taught directly, but I do work as a technical advisor on this course. And what we do is we typically pick a community. So city of White Bear Lake, they wanted to know how sustainable was their tree canopy. They're dealing with emerald ash borer, but they're also dealing with all the other things that causes trees to decline. There's drought, there's storm damage, and they want to know how sustainable is the tree canopy that they have, and how does that that translate then to stormwater management. So city of White Bear Lake has a lake in it, obviously, that's where the name comes from. But that lake level has been dropping because the city itself is outgrowing its capacity to utilize the water. And so the lake level is actually draining into the groundwater. And so stormwater is something they're really interested in. How do we keep as much of that on the landscape as possible so that it can maybe refill some of those aquifers? And then we've got this city of North St. Paul, it's just north of St. Paul. Um, the Emerald Ash Borer Management Plan is definitely something that they're really concerned about. Uh, it turns out that their city doesn't have a lot of ash, but all of it is, is in one neighborhood, and so those folks are very concerned about how ash might play out. And then we actually even worked on the campus. There's several woodlots, native woodlots, 
um, kind of naturalized areas. And one or two of them are not in the best shape. They've, they were there and they just haven't been managed or maintained. And so coming up with a plan to utilize that for both teaching and for recreation for students and for wildlife itself. So actually coming up with these plans. The idea with this course is it's a semester long project. So it's not a research project per se, it's a community engagement project. And what we do at the beginning of the class is actually work with a community or a couple of communities depending upon project size. And the class works together to address the issue, whatever that issue might be. So EAB, obviously a very hot topic right now in a lot of areas. And so you might work with a community that doesn't have or not sure what to go or, or, or how to approach it. And so the students actually meet with the community as a client. So this tests things like professionalism. They have to then write up a report. So you get some writing skills in there. And then they also have to present. And the way it usually works out is that some students might present, some students might write. Everybody contributes in some fashion to this, and maybe sometimes to their strength. And basically, at the very end, this project then is something they can use to put on resumes. They can talk about it as something. And we've actually had several communities implement at least portions, if not entire plans, that the students have come up with. So it's actually a benefit to those communities. And we tend to work with smaller communities that maybe don't have the resources or the budgets. We will work with larger communities on occasion, but we really try to find communities that are looking for the help and could really utilize the help. So it's been kind of a fun course to work with with students, and I see this as kind of the capstone. So one of the last courses you would take in sort of tying all this stuff together. And that, this class would bring in tree biology, right? pathogens. It would bring in soil sciences. It would bring in um, being able to identify trees, right? a very important part of it. We actually even have in this class a lot of landscape architects and urban studies students that will take this class. Um, even occasionally master's students looking for um, urban planning degrees. I think here it's called community regional planning, a master's in community uh, regional planning. And so this class would also hopefully attract so that you'd get a diversity of understanding and students could see that they could actually work together with planners and people that come from approach problems from our planning perspective as opposed from a biological perspective. So I put together a, so that you could see where I thought this might fit. And I'll actually pass these out if people are interested to look. But, um, oh, perfect, thank you. Um, so this is basically a sample four-year degree plan. So I took out, or I, what I did is I essentially looked at the, under the horticulture major, there was, a, I think, a plant science and a, and a propagation option. And so I basically used those as the base for this and then filled in the new courses where I thought they might fit logically. And obviously, this is just a sort of give an idea of where I thought things might fit. A lot of room here to uh, move things around. Uh, some classes might not be taught, that sort of thing. Bring in other courses and <coughs> sort of rely on the experts here and, and on this campus to really see how these might fit in. But you can see sort of highlighted on here. So if you're looking on your sheet, you can kind of get a feel for where these classes might fit in in the career of a student. Okay. Which may or may not take into account courses that are already almost exactly like you. Yes, yeah, absolutely. There are certain ones The. Um, yep, that's a fair point. Which makes it easier for you to actually commit and suggest a change. Yes. Rather than pushing through a new Yes, yep, absolutely. So my teaching philosophy, I student-centered learning, okay? So I really, instead of saying, what do I want to teach you, I think, what is it that I think is valuable for you to learn, okay? I think teaching is really about talking with students, getting them engaged, using an active learning environment. Hopefully that is somewhat challenging to the students themselves. And then listening to and hearing really what, where students are having trouble or what concepts are not um, making sense to them. Okay? So I think that really kind of wraps up exactly how I sort of approach each of the classrooms that I work in. Uh, this is Rachel. <laughs> Rachel is currently in my dendrology course. So I want to give you a, a sense of how I go about interacting with students. This year in dendrology, I interacted a weekly dendrology challenge, the weekly dendro challenge, where I post a question online that's a little bit more advanced. They have to go find a tree on campus and identify one that we're not actually covering in the class. They get to submit their answers. And then they get to win prizes. Uh, the prizes are actually just conference swag that I didn't actually want. <laughs> 
Um, but it's all unused, so it's so far it's going well. Rachel was the first winner. She was very happy. She is now transferred into major. Um, so I, I love it when students collaborate. This, <laughs> this actually happened. Um, Nadia was fairly short and was having trouble. We were talking about, this is a hackberry, we were talking about how to identify a hackberry, and Cody graciously said, I will, I will lift you up to look at the leaves if you bring some down for the rest of us, uh, which they did. Um, I also get some kind of quirky students on occasion. This was the final. Uh, Maddie decided to dress up as the Cheshire Cat. I have <laughs> absolutely no idea why, but I thought it was really fun in a way that students kind of got excited about the course. Uh, one year somebody dressed up as the Lorax. Um, so you can see Dane was on a trip somewhere. He emailed me. I think he was going down to Missouri for a forester's conclave. He was a, was a traditional forestry student. And he, inter he came across this uh, mound of mulch. And he was demonstrating, yeah, you remember you told us not to do this and that people do this? Um, so this was kind of fantastic. So students do email me on occasion after the fact, which is really a lot of fun. And uh, <laughs> Sonora got a little involved in her arboriculture project of trying to identify decay. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that students climb inside of a decaying tree, but um, she was fine. She's still fine. I've seen her around campus. Um, and it, even, so Minnesota is cold, right? It gets cold here, too. This was the final for the dendrology class. It was negative 13. Yeah, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> the students did a lot of jumping jacks, I'll not lie. There was a lot of running up and down the fields. So it really, uh, I, I want to highlight that I think the approach for me is to get students engaged. And I think that one of the ways they can be engaged is when they're really having a good time in class and also being able to demonstrate that they're learning something um, as they're going through the coursework. Okay. So outreach. So another, I think, important component is outreach. So I don't usually come into a community and say, here's what you need. I say, community, I'd love to work with you. What do you need? And so this year, we actually sent out to all of the communities throughout Minnesota, we sent out email surveys to say, what is the big urban forestry issue? What are some of the big urban forestry issues that you're having to deal with and face? And this is the result of that. You can see EAB tops the charts, right? Plant selection right below that, pests, pruning, diseases, diagnostics. These are all things that we teach and highlight in the course. This serves a couple of functions for us. One, it tells us what do those communities need, how can we best serve them. And two, it tells us what, what should we be focusing on in teaching in class. Right? So determining community program, but also helping us think, how do we, is there something we should be adding or taking away from the curriculum as we go through? So we can kind of evolve, and it's not a static thing. Uh, I definitely like to collaborate. These are just a few, right? I did some Google searching and found some, some really great programs that exist here in Nebraska. I realized that we would probably end up hopefully collaborating with other states, other communities, and certainly working with municipalities. I've been told about how great the Forest Service is here and sort of collaborating and, and really how interconnected a lot of urban and community forestry is in Nebraska. And I think leveraging those existing programs is very important. Uh, collaborating with local businesses and nonprofits. Um, the <laughs> steering committee asked me, or the, excuse me, the search committee asked me several questions about, I, I do uh, own with a group of others a, a nonprofit group called Brewing a Better Forest, where we lurk, work with local breweries to get people to adopt newly planted uh, street trees in Minneapolis. And then if they do so and they agree to water throughout the year, we send them a token to one of our partner breweries. Right, this was really sort of a fun program to integrate not only getting people to water trees, but also a way for businesses to get involved and to reach out to small businesses, which tend to work really closely with their communities. And so this was really sort of a fun way that we felt that we could, could um, interact with the community in somewhat of a new way and also reach, hopefully, a demographic of folks we don't usually get. So the people that have finished their degree but are really busy and want to be involved but maybe don't have the time. And this was a simple and easy way to do that. 
Uh, community engagement, definitely working with volunteers is a big part of what I do and what I think is important, especially in communities that maybe don't have the budgets to, to do everything they might like to do. So we've worked with programs where we go around and we actually train uh, people that live in those communities how to do things like identify trees, how to do things like hire, how do you actually go about hiring or writing contracts, right? How do you go about doing a tree inventory so that you know what your uh, issues might be going into the future? And then working with existing groups, of course, like Master Gardener Program that I know is here in Nebraska. Uh, very helpful. And then I think there's a good component of actually using outreach for professionals as well. Okay. So developing workshops. The workshops, definitely students we've had get involved in delivering or helping with workshop content, but also this is a way that we've used to sometimes attract students. Right? There are a lot of people in the field that have been working maybe with a two-year degree or maybe with no degree at all that especially in, in, in tree care have gotten into it and really want to learn more and know more. And so this has been a good way to help provide education and help provide renewing education for people that are in the business, but also sometimes attract new students for people that want to know more and come back to school. And new techniques and technologies, right? We like to show off and highlight companies sometimes that are using new techniques or technologies and how they're integrating them into their businesses. So we want to make sure that we're highlighting those and sharing those with people throughout, throughout the state and uh, sharing them with students as well. And I think there's good room for students to be involved with the Nebraska Arborist Association with the International Society of, of Arboriculture because those help to build professional connections throughout and um, a good way for students to get involved in the industry and actually make connections. So research, I think, is an important component. Identifying needs. So uh, this gentleman right here is Sam Bauer. He is a turf grass specialist. And if you're thinking, what does turf grass has, have to do with trees? Well, it usually grows under trees. Mm -hmm. And one of our problems that we've encountered is things like lawnmower blight, and where people kind of hit or run into trees with their lawnmowers. And Sam said, why aren't you planting no-mow or low-mow grasses? Why don't we look at how we can diversify the grass community and the turf underneath? And so we have partnered up with Sam to basically run a little bit of a research project to actually look at how do these grasses perform? Does it actually change the way people interact with trees? And uh, what's kind of unique challenges that we can run into and, and help solve? What does this guy have to do with urban forestry, right? Um, this is actually the textile testing facility at the University of Minnesota. Um, this guy back here, that's Guido. He was actually working on developing running fabrics. We used him because we wanted to know how quickly burlap decays. So for bald and burlap trees, we dug 40 trenches about two feet deep. When I say we, I mean I dug 40 trenches <laughs> two feet deep. Um, <laughs> and then we buried burlap. And we marked them, and we buried different types of burlap, so treated and untreated burlap. And then Gary, um, Gary Johnson basically went through, dug up the burlap once a month, and took it in to Guido, and then he tested the um, he tested the actual fabric to see w how much strength it was losing. And this was designed as a three-year project. It lasted 11 months. All the burlap was decayed. Uh, so there you go. Um, but it was really an interesting collaboration to work with somebody that said, you want us to do pull strength test on burlap? OK. You buried the burlap? OK. Um, but it worked out really sort of interesting. Research opportunities, right? disasters can be seen as an opportunity. This, there was a storm that came through Minneapolis in 2013, a, a pretty big windstorm, and we noticed a lot of trees. I think there were around 3,000 trees that had fallen over or tipped during the course of this storm. And we just kind of went around. We were collecting some data just haphazardly, and then some of us started noticing, hey, do you notice that a lot of these trees happen to be by new sidewalks? sidewalks had been repaired. Can we do anything with that? So we partnered with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, Division of Forestry, to actually establish a, uh, some funds to do some research. And we were able to determine that, yes, indeed, if, if you sever the roots within five years, some trees go down at about two and a quarter times more the frequency than trees that do not. So really utilizing that sort of unfortunate incident to highlight some research opportunities. And this is my research. This has been my sort of office the last couple of summers where um, this is overlooking the city of Minneapolis. And, and I essentially took 
tree cores of about 500 trees throughout the city's streets and parks. And I analyze the individual tree rings as I go through to generate colorful graphs like this that really show us how trees perform through time in different boulevard spaces through different types of construction versus no construction activities. So student engagement. <clears throat> Okay, uh, student engagement. There's internships, right? So we want to look at, uh, I think it's really important to, for students to have internships. Um, this is Emma. She basically worked for the city of St. Paul as a tree inspector. So the tree inspector program that we teach, we also let students take that for free. And she was able to work and utilize that for a summer job. And this is Melissa here up in a tree. She uh, learned how to climb and got a summer internship at a tree care company in order to actually get some experience. Right? So she's, Melissa will definitely be taking the ISA uh, exam and will be very well qualified for it. All the way up to, this is Elmer the Elm Tree. This is Minneapolis's uh, mascot for their urban forestry. So this is what somebody did as part of their student internship is they worked, they, they got to do more than just be Elmer, although they were also Elmer. I've been Elmer, it's fun. Um, and what they were able to do is basically work on the, the community outreach side. They were able to interface with people and talk about trees and talk about the importance, highlight the importance of trees right, in their communities. And so we try to get internships in any of these areas. It doesn't have to just be climbing trees. Sometimes it's working in GIS uh, for folks doing actual inventories. Sometimes it's working with public, rea public relations. And then beyond the academics, um, I would love to see working with other student groups or um, faculty here to try and get some sort of urban forestry club going. This is one that was started uh, on the St. Paul campus and we actually worked with um, existing arborists in the area that really thought the program was great to create a tree climbing club. They call it Tree Ascension Group. And students basically did field days. This is where they had um, Anybody could come and, this, and the student group would help, help them climb and get into trees safely and climb like professionals using the appropriate gear and get training and actually learn how to do this. And I think that's a fairly important aspect. We also realize students sometimes need to be fed. So we have a forester's day, although I think for an urban forestry program, we probably do an Arbor Day event, right? Where they feed them pancakes and things like that. And we invite people from all over the university to, to be involved and to be engaged in this program. And we also do a Forester's Day where people get to do axe throwing and chopping. Um, <laughs> different universities feel differently about that. Um, this, because it's a forestry school, there's a lot of sort of traditional forestry sports, but um, I, I think there's a, a good opportunity there to highlight what some of the urban forestry tasks are, which is rarely axe throwing. Um, hopefully is rarely axe throwing, right? Um, so I think that this is really an important thing to help students feel connected to the major, connected to the university, so that when they go out and maybe they leave Nebraska or they, they stay in the state, that they can actually highlight really what, it, what an amazing time they had to attract new students to talk about the program so that uh, funding and things like that can continue and build. So to sort of summarize, right, we went through, talked about some education, talked about some outreach opportunities, the potential to do a bit of research and how that can connect with students and the communities. A lot of the research we do is community focused or small scale that really is for applied uh, research. So working with and, and helping people in the field. And then uh, some student engagement, right? So really looking at how can we go about engaging students and and getting them involved in the campus life and in the program itself. And with that, thank you. I think there's, we have a few minutes left, so if there's questions or comments, I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Oh, thanks. And it seems like you have a really well thought out vision. Your first slide, uh, you mentioned diversity. Mm -hmm. I was wondering um, if you could expand on that, what you meant, because that's sort of a catchphrase that can mean sure. a lot of different things. Yeah, I think what we see in, or what has been talked about in some of the literature and what we've definitely seen in industry, and there's been a call for this, is that it tends to be white male dominated field. And I think in anything we can do to reach out to uh, try and increase that to make sure that it's being, um, that any group that would like to be part of it has the opportunity, knows about it, one, and has the opportunity to be involved, and also feels not uncomfortable being involved. I know that I have worked with a lot of 
uh, women in tree care companies. And they've definitely expressed difficulties in feeling just uncomfortable in sort of a macho or a traditionally sort of macho male-centric um, field. And I would like to see that change. And I think one of the ways we do that is by going into, or potentially one of the ways we do that is by specifically um, starting really young, right? I think it's hard to, to diversify from a pool of people that already exist. And so not that we shouldn't try, but I think that starting young and trying to get into schools and showing and then having excellent role models. Right? I really love to see um, when there are people besides just young white men that um, have traditionally dominated the field where you can say, look, these people are successful and you can identify with them and there's professionalism. And so that's what I mean by hopefully getting a diverse group of, of individuals. So as you think about uh, the program, Mary, could you tell us what you think is the, the greatest opportunity out there and the greatest challenge that you see? You mean the greatest opportunity in terms of developing the program? Developing this program and get it up and running. I think the greatest opportunity is that it's going to be, uh, um, you know, that the hope is that it will be its own major. And I think that that really shows the ability that UNL has to sort of drive the future of what other programs might look like as they start propping up. There's been several, um, there was a talk at, at the ISA conference in Texas this year. Um, Virginia Tech uh, was doing some research into why, why is it difficult to attract? And when you look at all the different urban forestry programs, they're called something different everywhere you go. And so it's difficult to really track um, how that is. And so I think the great opportunity here is that it's very obvious. It would be called urban and community forestry. That's what you could go for. And when then, when they do needs assessment surveys of what are you looking for to industry and municipalities, saying we need people that are trained specifically in urban and community forestry. And I think the ability to sort of start with that or start designing a program that really addresses those needs, as more and more people, we're not moving into the into the country and fields anymore, right? We're moving into urban areas. And the more we move into urban areas, the more populated they get, the more pressure there is on our urban natural resources, and the more we're going to need highly trained individuals and skilled individuals to manage those. And I think that the opportunity to, to do that um, will be is, is great. In terms of the challenges, I think it's really challenging to start something completely, um, to build something, and not, not completely from scratch. I realize there's lots of things that are already here that will help in the foundation of it, but I think just getting that ball rolling and making sure that um, it moves along at a fairly, at a good pace so that we can attract students. I think there's some challenges in actually letting students know what urban forestry is. One of my first slides talking about changes in perception. Um, that it's not just about cutting trees, it's not just about pruning, there's lots of different avenues you can go to um, that involve trees and urban natural resources. And so I think that'll be a, a challenge and some, uh, and we'll really take the efforts of a lot of folks in collaborating together to, to decide how best to attract students and let them know what's out there and what's available. Um, <clears throat> with the development of this program, and I, you know, I keep hearing how we're gonna be the furthest west um, university mm -hmm. um, offering this program, but when you think of Nebraska, you don't typically think of trees, you think yeah. of corn and like yeah. that. Um, how do you see us going out and reaching the students out in the West or even along the East Coast and um, getting them to come here and think of this as a good opportunity rather than like, why would I go to Nebraska for this? <laughs> yeah, that's um, so I, I should have, we could put this in a recruitment video, but I, when I was flying here, I was taking pictures out. I never, my wife usually sits next to the window, so I actually got to sit out the window, and I was taking pictures out, and what I found amazing was that even in areas, so Minnesota is fairly forested in a lot of areas, even in Minnesota, as we were flying over, the most heavily forested areas were the urban areas. And as you fly further west, you see that even more striking. As you fly over, it's that where people are, where trees are. And so I think just being able to highlight that and remind people, yeah, yeah, okay, maybe there's not huge forest land, but all the, a lot of the forest land, not all of the forest land, but a lot of the forest land that is here is urban forest. This is a great opportunity for really looking at and studying urban forestry here because you're not distracted by the, you know, Woodlands. The sequoias around. Yeah, there's, you know, there's no sequoias. <laughs> it's fantastic. But there's lots, and, and really here you, you have a, a, 
an area where, you know, Minnesota, we're a little more limited in some of the species we can plant. And here you have a little bit more um, species you can plant. I've seen things that are growing really well here that are shrubbier back home, shall we say. Um, so I think that opportunity, right, diversity of species, and being able to really highlight that. Plus, you've got the Arbor Day Foundation here. This is the Arbor Day State. I mean, what a great... Um, what a great thing to highlight, and I'm sure that, and I would hope, and I'm sure that they would be a fantastic partner to help highlight that this is a great place to, to study urban forestry. How would you tap into those populations at West, though? Like, what would you hit to try to get our information out there to let them know that they should come here? Yeah, I think that, um, I, I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Um, I think that I'm hoping to be able to collaborate with national organizations like ISA. ISA is a great, um, promoter of programs. And once they hit a program that they think is good, they're really good at coming out and saying, this program is great. I think Arbor Day Foundation is another one that does that. I think, um, I think it's Dana Quello, who is the, right, she's the, the urban forestry at the federal level station in Colorado. I think that she uh, would be a great way to sort of interface um, in terms of disseminating information to the region. Um, that's how we. That's that's how I've seen it done in other places, and I think utilizing those um, folks is a great way to to sort of disseminate that information. Yeah. So when uh, <coughs> you're managing our urban forest, and then you cut down the trees, mm -hmm. then what? Does that need to be part of the discussion or utilization or? Yeah. <coughs> Absolutely. I think we were just kind of chatting at this over lunch. I think that there is a growing opportunity for urban wood utilization. And if we look to states like Wisconsin, which are really doing a fantastic job saying best use first for Milwaukee in particular, which has been a leader in urban forestry for many years. And they look at it as establishing a partnership between the city and local businesses to say, We've got all these trees we have to take down. A lot of them are in okay shape from a wood perspective. Right? They might be dead, but the wood is still usable. And so they actually have worked with a couple of small mills, a couple of small sawmills that specialize in, in using urban wood. So they'll actually run a, uh, a hand metal detector over the a lot of metal in urban trees. So they run a hand metal detector over it. They do a cut. They run a hand metal detector. They cut. They, you know, they keep doing it. I have a great example. I should have brought it with um, of a, somebody that shot a tree, <laughs> and it wasn't detected. It, and ironically enough, it was destined for a gun stock. Was where this chunk of wood was for. It's really a fantastic example. Um, but they are really good at detecting that. In Minnesota, there's a company called Wood from the Hood. Uh, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of clever folks, right? Um, but Wood from the Hood really specializes in use, utilizing urban wood. And, and their goal is to try, they're working on, and I'm not sure where they are on this progress, but they're working on, so there's sustainable forestry, where they work with the, um, to try and say, oh, wood is harvested in a sustainable fashion. They're trying to get some sort of urban designator to say, this is urban wood. This is quite possibly one of some of the more sustainable ways to do it. These trees are dead. We're removing them when they've outlived their usefulness, and but we can still outlive their usefulness as, as living entities, but we can still utilize their wood. And, and they've made some great products. And I think we're starting to see that more, especially in the wake of Michigan, which has uh, millions of trees, I believe it was, that were struck by emerald ash borer. So I think there's opportunities there. I have a question. What, what role would you see the big um, urban forestry companies like Davy or Barbara, what role could or would they play in this major? Um, <clears throat> Davy and Bartlett for those of you who don't know, are nationwide companies that do tree care and they do everything from consulting. Bartlett does a lot of research. Davy Group has worked with the US Forest Service to create a suite of software called iTree, which is to figure out tree benefits. And I think that their role is sometimes um, to be able to bring them in and, and help say, hey, this is a great program. We want you to come here and hire our graduates. Right? Um, I think that that's a big thing. If students see that people from Davy are coming to hire the graduates, I think that's a good role. I think it's also a good way to stay connected. I know Tom Smiley at Bartlett does a fantastic job doing a lot of research, and I think being able to maybe even do a collaborative project 
with some of those tree care companies and say what kinds of things could we do together to advance um, urban forestry and, and arboriculture would be a great way to collaborate. But really, even if it's just on the, the lowest level of you know, bringing them in and, and having places for students that they know they can get a job and that those companies know that students coming out of UNL are ready to work and prepared, I think is a great way to interface with companies like that. Eric? Yeah. This morning you mentioned landscape design mm -hmm. and management. Yes. So since your position is actually to create a new major, yes. what approach would you take, or could you assume if it wasn't given to you, <laughs> to basically say, let's brainstorm? But for this new major and the old ones that exist, that mm -hmm. have elements of start all over from scratch. Yeah. Is that a, could you do that or should you do that? Yes and yes. And how oh, okay. There's more. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think I think that that's a, a great approach, actually. Right. I. I had a difficult time putting this presentation together because my approach is rarely to come in and say, here's what you should do. My approach is usually to sit down and say, all right, what are we thinking? Where are we at? What, how can we use what's here? I hate, uh, you know, I, I hate to even throw away my IT degree, right? So I, I use it for data management skills and data analytics. And I think that I would love to do the same thing here is sit down, identify, um, and really look to the faculty here and, and Scott to say where, who are the, the sort of people that are really interested in getting this set? It let's let's set up um, a committee to talk about. And I think there's a handful of classes that are probably pretty easy. Like um, arboriculture, I think is is a perfect example of a class that I I didn't see it listed anywhere, so I don't think it's here. So and I think that that's a natural one. We could just start teaching that and kind of go and see how that plays in. For some of the other courses, the suggestions I think. The dendrology, there are several other classes in plant ID, and so it would be interesting to see, can we either tweak it, or is the one I'm proposing different enough, or um, how would we work together to get that in? Because really, it's about identifying trees. In terms of the others, I think um, landscaping and sitting down and really figuring out, well, what are the important issues? Where are we missing, or where is society uh, as a whole missing when it comes to trees in an urban environment? And is there some way we can design a course to address part of that? And I, th I think that that's how I would really prefer to approach it, as opposed to saying, this is the stuff I've done elsewhere. We should just do it here. I would rather say, how can we work together to create a really fantastic program that, that highlights um, all of the great things that are already happening here, and then highlights some of the experience that I could bring, and, and hopefully would bring. Yeah? Um, about wildlife damage management, I think a deer, other things mm -hmm. didn't mention that <clears throat> they had a strength area and extension of wildlife damage management. Mm -hmm. Faculty went to Stephen's point actually. <laughs> the administration decided not to follow on that. Mm -hmm. But I know there's deer in the Twin Cities. Lots of deer. Yep, deer. And how does that all? Both of the management, but all in, and how do we work that into the curriculum? Yeah, I think in at least in the classes that I proposed, I think that there's a natural fit for that in urban ecosystems, in urban ecology. Deer, bunnies, rodents of all kinds, right, are all part of the urban ecosystem, and I think that there's plenty of opportunity to discuss how that management of that would work, and 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 also for the urban green space management course, that was actually one of the projects one of the years was to look at urban deer management. And how can a city actually address that? Because it does pro cause problems, particularly in the natural areas and homeowners that are abutting natural areas. Um, and so I think that it's a natural fit into both of those or either of those or some other course that kind of revolves around that issue from planning to management once it's planned. But yeah, I think that urban wildlife and even looking at things like pollinators and establishing habitat and creating um, habitat corridors that actually connect areas where there's lots of diversity to areas where there's a little more minimal diversity are all important components that I think would fit into the urban ecosystems course or an urban forestry course, either one or both, if, uh, depending upon how that would go and work out. Yeah? If you were um, to come here and Program, do you see it as being kind of an overarching, all encompassing program, or do you see it having um, more like options underneath it that have more of a focus? 
focus in a certain career path. We do have some majors here on campus that do that, so maybe one that's more like pest and sex that we take more entomology classes mm -hmm. versus one that's more of like an urban planning. How do you how do you see this shaping? Um, I would see probably this as being a more overarching program and then students, I'm assuming there are minors that are available. I would assume that students that are more interested in entomology, for instance, might do something along that lines where they get a minor that addresses those more specific needs. Um, but I'm certainly open to if there were other paths that made sense. One of the things that I've noticed at, in, in our department at the University of Minnesota, and they've tried to correct for it, I don't know how well it worked, is that they had too many paths, and they all differed by about three, two or three classes, and it just became difficult for students to choose, like, what, are these really different, what's different about these courses? And so I, I tend to go for, uh, let's get everything under here, and then if you want to specialize, that's what minors are really good at, good for, I think. Um, so that would be my initial reaction, but I'm, you know, I'm certainly open to to, to working with others, right, and in terms of how that might ultimately play out. Other questions? Yeah. So you're doing your PhD right now and focusing on research and doing outreach on the side or in your spare time. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious, uh, if you came here, you wouldn't really have a research appointment at all and mm -hmm. even less opportunity to do so. How would you feel about that? Uh, I'm, I'm okay with that, actually. I, my, I love teaching. Teaching is really what I have a lot of passion about. I think that there is always an opportunity to do research. As you pointed out, I don't sleep a lot. Um, <laughs> so I think there are always ways to work with communities in some capacity. And I think that research is while not a major component, is still an important thing. One, even if they're small projects. I mean, I, I look at our burlap study. That's not publishable per se, but it was really helpful to help us answer questions. And so I think even doing little projects like that, the turf grass project, is not exactly a scientific publishable thing. We don't have enough replications. There's, but really being able to do that and looking at that as this sort of applied approach to it um, is great for me. And I, I think that um, there could always be opportunities for these small or little projects to, to attach to the program. And sometimes it'd just be about giving students an opportunity. I'm not sure if there's something uh, in Minnesota we call it the Europ project. It's the undergraduate uh, research opportunities. So I think looking at, uh, what is it called? You care? Yeah, I think looking at even doing stuff like that and helping students think about research questions for those folks that want to go on to a higher level degree I think is, is very useful. But yeah, it wouldn't bother me if, if I couldn't do large-scale research projects. I think teaching is really my what, what I love to spend the, the bulk of my time on. What other questions do you have? <laughs> yeah. So, so what are you finding out with your research? Yeah, good question. Um, <clears throat> thank you for asking. I think it's. Um, <laughs> So one of the things that I'm finding out, the first question I'm looking at is really the differential species response to construction activities. And by construction, I mean sidewalk. And typically, we're assuming root severance, although we don't necessarily know that. And by utilizing the tree rings, I'm able to measure each individual tree ring um, down to something like 1 1,000th of a millimeter. So I can really get pretty uh, precise uh, measurements so that we can track really small changes through time. One of the things we're noting is that one of the species I'm looking at is basswood. You can do whatever you want to basswood. It doesn't care. Um, it just keeps growing at phenomenal rates. The problem is that if we combine that with other research is that basswood will also fall over at the drop of a hat. So even though the growth isn't slowed, there are management implications in terms of the damage that is not growth related. Uh, so I think that's a really sort of fascinating outcome. Things like honey locusts, which have traditionally been thought of as really tough trees, their growth almost goes in half, but then it rides along at this lower level. And so there's some use there that you can think about in these really tougher sites. Basswood's not great because if, it, if you impact it, it keeps growing and getting bigger, and then it falls on you know, something that you don't want to fall on. Uh, so I'll, the, uh, I actually just use the genus for Tilia. There wasn't enough. I'm using inventories from both of the cities. And there was not enough detailed ID 
to <laughs> very easily identify where, yeah, some of you are shaking your head, yep. Um, <laughs> with honey locusts, it was much easier. We basically have one species and some cultivars, uh, and I haven't separated out cultivars. Yeah. So some of these species that we think of as being, oh, basswood's really sensitive. Turns out that growth-wise, not so much. Um, Stability-wise, yeah, it's pretty sensitive. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. And in terms of their response and in terms of their return to normal, basswood basically returned to normal in one season or one growth season. Honey locust has never returned to normal after five years. But normal, I mean pre pre-growth and compared to trees that had not had construction damage. And we're seeing differences in terms of resilience and resistance to even things like drought. And I have tree cores in my bag. I found that they <laughs> made it with me. If anybody wants to look at them, they're really fascinating. I could talk for hours about tree cores. So, um, yeah, any, any, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'll keep going. We'll be here all night. Um, yeah. Other questions? Okay, well, we have, uh, we have a video of this, and we'll post this on our website.